Uh, today will be given by Professor Ross McFedrin. Ross is a professor at the um, School of Physics here in Sydney. He's uh, one of the leading international experts on the interaction of electromagnetic waves with uh, structured media and was one of the first persons to realize that the colors, the iridescent colors uh, in butterflies or sea creatures are um, explained in terms of defective effects. Um, uh, recently, I uh, applied this knowledge uh, to explain the fundamental properties of artificially created photonic crystals. And most recently, his work uh, has concentrated on, or his, much of his work on invisibly thoughts has been uh, highly uh, acknowledged internationally. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'll be giving two lectures. Uh, the break between the two is somewhat artificial. Um, the, uh, topic, uh, the, the topic uh, on which I'm talking um, is somewhat unusual in that um, the topic really started um, uh, during the time most of you have been at university. So it's a very, very recent field and a very active field. Um, so, uh, here are some points from uh, what I'm going to be discussing. Uh, I'll be discussing metamaterials. Um, I won't get to the definition until towards the end of this first lecture. Um, and I'll be comparing and contrasting them to some extent with photonic crystals, uh, talking about uh, uh, their properties, what they enable you to do. Um, then, in the second lecture, I'll be talking about transform optics, uh, which is a very new field. Uh, which uh, in fact powers a lot of the activity in metamaterials, um, talking about its outcomes, uh, then going on to cloaking uh, and talking about some different cloaking methods. Um, the origin of metamaterials is uh, universally acknowledged uh, to be in a paper uh, written by um, uh, uh, Veseligo, in fact Veseligo's first scientific paper, uh, published in Russian in 67 and in English in 68, uh, called The Electrodynamics of Substances with uh, Simultaneously Negative Values of Epsilon and Mu. Um, this, this paper was a real sleeper uh, in that it existed in the Soviet literature and I believe it influenced um, some classified Soviet research, uh, but in the West it was uh, ignored uh, for uh, around uh, 40 years. Veseligo um, actually was thinking about uh, what would happen. Um, he thought about this, this diagram uh, where we have, um, is there a pointer? Okay. Uh, if you construct a, a diagram of dielectric permittivity, epsilon versus magnetic permeability mu. Um, the conventional uh, region is the region where uh, epsilon is positive and, and mu is positive. Thank you. Um, so this is the uh, quadrant which people are most familiar with, uh, ordinary dielectrics sit there. I remind you that epsilon and mu are, are connected with uh, by Maxwell's relation uh, with the refractive index n, n equals square root epsilon mu. Um, at least that's that's the way it's always interpreted. I'll be coming back to that in a second. So uh, the usual region of dielectrics is epsilon greater than naught, mu greater than naught. Um, dielectrics uh, can can be replaced by metals. Uh, now metals have a, a complex value of epsilon in general, uh, but the real part of that complex number uh, can be negative, uh, and indeed is negative uh, in important spectral regions, and that's uh, the foundation of a, a new uh, subject, a, a very uh, hot topic in, in objects called plasmonics, which I'll be referring to tangentially later. So this is the region of uh, metals, uh, where epsilon is negative and mu is greater than uh, zero. Uh, and electromagnetic waves in this region, uh, they propagate uh, and attenuate due to uh, electric field interactions and only dissipation. Uh, the counterpart to that 
would be a medium where epsilon was positive uh, and mu was negative. Uh, if you look at what Maxwell says, if one or other of these is positive, the other is negative, uh, you get a square root of a negative number, uh, which gives you a factor of i multiplying a positive number. That factor of i, when you stick it into the equation of the plane wave, says the plane wave will attenuate. So this quadrant and that quadrant are uh, two quadrants where you get attenuation. Uh, this quadrant, you get attenuation to electric field effects. Uh, this quadrant, you get attenuation due to magnetic field effects. But uh, this Largo thought, uh, how about this um, uh, third quadrant where both of them are negative? Well, if both of them are negative, uh, then this is positive. So I don't need an I coming out of that. I've got a square root of a positive number. So again, this quadrant and that quadrant are the quadrant where waves can propagate freely. But Vesalago investigated uh, in detail the physics of what would occur in this quadrant and he discovered that in fact you should alter Maxwell's famous equation connecting uh, refractive index with epsilon and mu. The real equation is n squared equals epsilon mu. So uh, when you take a square root, you've always got uh, the choice of whether you take a plus or a minus sign in front of that square root. So Vesalago considered this quadrant and discovered that in fact you should replace Maxwell by n equals minus square root epsilon mu. So uh, this third quadrant uh, is the quadrant of metamaterials uh, which gives you um, the new and striking properties that Vesalago found out about. So just repeating that, the first quadrant, conventional dielectrics, second quadrant, lossy magnetic, fourth quadrant, lossy electric, the third quadrant gives you free propagation, uh, but uh, as Vesalago found out, uh, the characteristics are in a way left-handed uh, because things go in the opposite direction uh, to what you expect. So one of the things that uh, Vesalago found out uh, was that um, Snell's law um, actually was different in its operation. So, if you take a normal material with uh, Snell's law or the Snell Descartes law, or Descartes law as uh, the French call it, uh, you have a media uh, array coming into a dielectric medium. Uh, if this refractive index here is greater than one, then the ray is refracted towards the normal. But the refracted ray, in any circumstance, regardless of the refractive heat index here, in a conventional dielectric, the instant ray and the um, refracted ray are on opposite sides of the uh, normal to the interface. Okay? And what Vesalago found, uh, as I said, he found that in this fourth quadrant of uh, materials, you really should be taking n equals minus square root epsilon mu, uh, and that gives you a uh, left-handed medium uh, which has got a refracted ray uh, on the same side of the normal as the instant ray. So the refraction diagram looks like that. Um, so this is uh, one reason why the media are called left-handed. Um, uh, second reason uh, comes um, through the orientation of our electric and magnetic fields uh, and um, the wave vector of a plane wave. So, um, Vesalago's idea, uh, as I said, uh, was appreciated by some uh, in the Russian literature, uh, but everybody else said, well, that would be fine uh, if you could make such materials. Uh, we don't know how to make materials, so this is uh, theoreticians uh, just playing in, the, in their sandpit uh, without regard to practical applications. Um, however, um, you can get negative refraction um, in uh, photonic crystals, uh, and I'll show you, uh, in fact, an animation of that in a second, uh, just to give you the data of that photonic crystal. A photonic crystal um, is, uh, in this case, a set of dielectric rods. Uh, I'm going to take a finite photonic crystal, so there will be six layers of dielectric rods. Um, the dielectric rods are high index rods, a refractive index of three, that's around uh, the refractive index uh, associated with silicon. Uh, the radius is 0.3 times the period, they're in air, um, and um, just to show what's going on clearly, uh, instead of having plane waves coming in, I've got waves uh, which are made up 
of a Gaussian section, so they're actually localized in space. You can see the finite cross section of the beam, and, and the beam is repeated um, periodically. So, just to show you uh, this anima animation. So, um, what you can see then is, you can see um, the instant wave coming in here. You can see these uh, six layers of something or other there, uh, which is six layers of high index cylinders. Now, this is like uh, a layer of an equivalent dielectric, but you can see that the instant wave comes in here. It's refracted in the way of negative refraction, exactly that ray diagram that I showed you, and it goes out that way. So the instant beam is there, uh, it goes that way and that way. So in fact, the displacement between the instant beam and the refracted beam has the opposite sign from what you would expect. So as well as the angle being on the opposite side, uh, a consequence of that is the beam displacement is also negative. Um, you can also see other things which are going on because this instant beam comes down like that. Uh, there's a bit of it which uh, is reflected going out there. Another bit comes here, is uh, transmitted there. Some of that is actually bounced up there uh, and in fact comes out parallel to this beam but displaced negatively. There's more of it reflected at the top, comes down here and you get a second transmitted beam um, and so on. You can see the various uh, beams which are created in this slab, they get fainter and fainter as the number of reflections and transmissions required to create them increases. So what you can see here is that this photonic crystal, uh, again, uh, it's not a, a Vesselago material, uh, but it can give you one of the characteristics of uh, Vesselago materials uh, in that it gives you uh, a negative refraction. Um, the instant refractive beam are on the same side of the normal as each other um, and it can give you this uh, shift of the beam uh, which is called the goose hansen shift which again is negative. So uh, photonic crystals are, are one uh, material which can give you some of the characteristics required uh, by uh, Vesselago. So. So these uh, photonic crystals are uh, a substance or a, a material which is um, capable of um, giving you uh, negative refraction. Um, one way of looking at Snell's law which uh, perhaps may not have been um, taught to you or you may not have thought about is that it's an expression of conservation of momentum uh, parallel uh, to the interface between uh, two media. Okay? So if you've got a photon coming in, uh, then you can break up its momentum into a momentum parallel to the surface and momentum uh, perpendicular to the surface. Uh, in an unstructured dielectric uh, material, uh, the momentum parallel to the surface uh, is conserved. Right? So um, what that says then is your wave comes in, you break up its momentum, uh, into the component parallel and the component perpendicular and the component parallel isn't changed uh, which is why the refracted ray has to be on the opposite side of the normal uh, to the instant ray. Right. So uh, a negative refraction uh, apparently uh, breaks momentum conservation uh, and it's always achieved uh, using structured materials. So uh, putting that in uh, mathematics, uh, the instant ray uh, in a material with a refractive index Ni, uh, you can associate uh, a, a wave vector, K uh, of the instant uh, ray, uh, and you take the X component of that. So Snell's law says Ni Kix equals Nr Krx, uh, where uh, K denotes uh, a wave vector with uh, 2 pi of lambda, uh, and this lambda is a free space lambda, just to make the dependence on the refractive index clear. Now what happens in a structured material um, is that um, NIKIX uh, equals NRKRX is actually replaced by uh, the possibility of having transfer of momentum uh, parallel uh, to the direction of periodicity. So you get a 2 pi on D 
uh, which uh, D uh, is the periodicity distance, uh, 2 pi on D gives you the momentum transfer associated with this, uh, and you can take any integer multiple of 2 pi on D, and that gives you momentum transfer. So uh, this structured material then uh, is behaving like a, a diffraction grating, uh, and for those of you who know the diffraction grating equation, uh, this is the diffraction equation, uh, diffraction grating equation, uh, where P is the order of diffraction. So um, immediately you see um, that um, uh, structured materials are the way that you're going to be able to construct negative index materials. Okay? There's always a structure associated with the material, uh, and it's the interaction of uh, light with structured materials uh, which makes uh, negative uh, refraction uh, possible. So, um, in uh, an incredibly highly cited paper, um, Sir John Penry, around 2000, uh, realised uh, from Vesalago's prescription that he could do something uh, extraordinary with that. He realised that uh, negative uh, refraction uh, could uh, make it possible uh, to take a plain slab. Normal lenses have one surface curved or two surfaces curved and act, they act as a lens because of that. Um, Pedri realised that if you had a negative index then you could get focusing uh, without curvature. Okay, This was uh, the incredible realisation he had and he added to that uh, by realising in general uh, that it would be possible in principle uh, to have uh, super resolution, uh, resolution uh, better than the normal uh, rally uh, limit on resolution which is around a half a wavelength. Okay? So up until that point uh, it had been thought A that you couldn't have um, focusing by a plain dielectric slab uh, and B that it was very difficult uh, to get uh, resolution much better than the rally limit. So with these uh, two ideas, uh, Pendry uh, set in motion the, the fantastic interest there is today in the field of metamaterials and negative index media. Um, the reason why you can do better than the rally limit uh, was proved in Pendry's paper, um, and he showed that negative refraction um, lenses can preserve the information um, in even S and orders. So um, this is um, the uh, Pendry uh, diagram um, of refraction. So you have this wave coming in. Uh, we've seen the refraction diagram looks normal, uh, looks different from uh, the normal refraction diagram. The ray comes in. The refracted ray um, is on the same side as the normal. We have another ray here. Its refracted ray is on the same side of the normal. The consequence of that is that those two refracted rays uh, actually give you a focal point inside that dielectric slab with negative n. Um, and then you continue your uh, ray tracer away from the focus, you get negative refraction again here, um, and what you get is a negative, uh, you get uh, two instances of negative refraction, giving you a point image here, which is exactly um, the same distance behind the lens uh, as the uh, point source is in front of the lens. So, um, Pendry uh, also realised um, that um, this uh, was um, associated, again, if you think about uh, Fermat's principle, uh, it has a very interesting interpretation. Fermat's principle says that um, light follows uh, a path with the shortest optical distance. The optical distance is given by refractive index multiplied by length. So if you uh, take this uh, diagram uh, and you take this length of propagation as multiplied by the refractive index of air, uh, if you take this one and you assume the refractive index is minus one, um, then you find that that length and that length uh, add up to zero in terms of the optical path length. Uh, and exactly the same here and here. So in terms of uh, Fermat's principle, uh, in fact, this point and that point are coincident. So light has gone zero optical path length, which is one reason you can argue why you've got super resolution and why you haven't lost information in these evanescent waves. Okay? 
the, the normal thing that occurs is a ray comes in here, uh, this ray coming from a point source has got a mixture of propagating waves and evanescent waves. The evanescent waves get weaker as you propagate, they're reflected mostly here, uh, and then they get weaker still as we go through here, etc, etc. So normally you lose that information uh, upon propagation over a few wavelengths, but uh, the weakening effect is associated with the optical path length. The optical path length involves refractive index times distance. Refractive index is negative, you can have optical path length zero, therefore you don't lose your evanescent waves. If you don't lose your evanescent waves, your resolution is not limited by Rayleigh's criteria. So this uh, paper was immensely controversial. Uh, it's now uh, immensely respected, immensely uh, cited. Um, and uh, if you look it up on Web of Science, uh, you'll find a number of citations. Yuri, what is it these days? In the check for all the time, yeah. Uh, it's in the order of 5,000, 7,000 citations. Oh, not not, not yet? No. I think you'd be surprised if you look at those. It, it actually accumulates citations at a fantastic rate. Amazing. Um, okay, so uh, Pedri went uh, went beyond these ideas uh, because uh, if he wanted to make uh, this practical, he had to avoid the objection uh, that Veseligo's work had created. Um, and so uh, what he uh, did was create uh, a couple of building blocks uh, from which you could make actual metamaterials. Uh, the first of these building blocks uh, was a negative epsilon material. I remind you, uh, to get into our fourth quadrant, we need both negative epsilon and negative mu. Uh, the negative epsilon uh, was the, uh, the easy bit of the equation because it was fairly well known in the electrical engineering literature. Uh, Henry uh, published this paper uh, in 1996. Uh, I published a, a paper uh, with colleagues uh, the year before. Um, in fact, this is the uh, first Australian paper uh, essentially on the theory of photonic crystals. Uh, so it's a paper I'm rather fond of. Uh, it's not cited as well as this one, uh, but some of the conclusions there in it are exactly the same. So, just to show you how uh, this works, um, this is a diagram from our paper, essentially a frequency on the vertical axis, uh, and this horizontal axis is conventional in photonic crystals, uh, and essentially gives you a direction of propagation uh, of waves with that frequency. Uh, and the uh, curved lines here actually tell you uh, the uh, propagation equation, the connection between uh, frequency and wave number along this uh, axis, uh, and so these lines represent uh, propagation, uh, and you'll notice there is this very big region here uh, where there is no propagation at all. So waves uh, with the, the frequency in this region which enter a uh, photonic crystal made of uh, these uh, cylinders uh, of um, conducting metal, um, they, they can't propagate um, and they attenuate as they propagate. So uh, when you ask what sort of a material is it which attenuates uh, waves as they propagate, then it's a material with a negative epsilon, because negative epsilon, when you take its square root, gives you an imaginary refractive index, and that gives you uh, this attenuating wave. So, uh, the epsilon effective, uh, effective permittivity of these arrays, uh, is given by a simple equation, one minus uh, what's called the plasma frequency squared, uh, divided by the angular frequency squared. Anybody who's worked with plasmas will recognize this as exactly the dispersion equation for a free electron plasma. So it's exactly the same equation as can be applied to the Earth's ionosphere. So this uh, phenomenon is the same phenomenon as keeps uh, radio waves uh, reflected um, by the ionosphere and enables long distance radio communications. Here it gives us what we want. It gives us uh, an epsilon which is negative uh, when omega is less than omega p. The formula for omega p uh, is actually a, a rather interesting uh, formula because it gives you omega p squared uh, is essentially scaling as the log 
of the spacing in the array divided by the radius of the wire. Okay, so as you make the wires thinner and thinner, that gap closes up, but it closes up as one on the square root of the log of the radius, which is incredibly slow law. Um, so uh, that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, you can derive that uh, fairly simply uh, if you know the right way of proceeding. So, um, Pendry also needed structures uh, which um, would give them, uh, uh, would give him uh, materials with uh, magnetic resonance and mu less than naught. So the um, the paper which uh, contained that uh, information was uh, published in IEEE um, Microwave Theory and Techniques um, in uh, 1999, I think. Magnetism from conductors and enhanced nonlinear phenomena. I've taken a diagram of the structure from a later paper uh, where uh, Pendry talked about this structure, which is called the Pendry double C. He talked about that arranged in a plane, and to give him a plane of structure, these authors were in fact interested in what happened, what would happen if you made uh, cubes out of the double C structure, and then you could stack the cubes together and make a whole volume of negative uh, mu material rather than just a plane of negative new material. Um, so uh, the, uh, what you'll see here is you'll see uh, what's called a double C. Uh, this is um, one of the C's, the inner one, then you have an outer C, okay? Um, so these C's are made of conducting wire, so the, the currents are shown by these arrows, and they flow along the C, uh, and they have to stop at these gaps. So uh, these uh, uh, long straight stretches of conductors behave like inductors and the narrow gaps uh, behave like capacitors. So this is really like a series inductor capacitor circuit and you know that inductor capacitor circuits have resonances uh, and that's the mechanism of the magnetic resonance uh, and in the region of the magnetic resonance uh, you can get um, a negative mu. Negative mu uh, is much harder uh, to achieve uh, than negative epsilon, uh, and so this is the delicate uh, part of the Pendry recipe for making metamaterials, uh, but it can be done. Uh, people started at longer wavelengths, microwaves, and worked towards the visible, uh, refining and adapting the design to make it work at ever shorter wavelengths. Um, so, in fact, it has been demonstrated uh, in near visible wavelengths um, that you can get these uh, uh, magnetic resonances. So, what is a metamaterial then? I've been talking about how you might make it. I've said that one of its characteristics um, is that it's left-handed, so um, uh, you get negative refraction. So, um, I've also argued that negative refraction tells you you must have uh, a microstructure there. You must have periodicity so you can get momentum conservation of the surface. Um, so, uh, Pendry said that this material has to be microstructured, uh, but it should be finely enough microstructured so uh, you uh, see the effects of the microstructure, uh, but you don't see the microstructure itself directly. So, uh, it uh, appears homogeneous uh, to the wavelength of the radiation, uh, except when you calculate momentum transfers and the like. Um, Pembry also said, um, even though we've got negative refraction in a photonic crystal, um, this, Pembry says, is not the full story. The photonic crystal essentially is a dielectric structure, uh, and it's essentially <coughs> just controlling the electric field, and the magnetic field is following. Uh, Pembry said that a, uh, a metamaterial uh, should, uh, should control both electric and magnetic fields uh, simultaneously, so it should have its electric uh, resonance and its magnetic resonance are both built into it. Okay, so it's going to have both types of resonance there, uh, and it's going to be a metamaterial when both resonant regions overlap. Um, the boundary, however, between photonic crystals and metamaterials is not clear cut because as soon as Pendrish started showing these terrifically interesting properties uh, associated with magnetic effects in structured materials. Uh, people looked at 
what happens if you put magnetic materials in a photonic crystal. So this is not a, a clear-cut boundary. I don't think it is. I think uh, those two fields uh, essentially will merge over time. Um, as well as um, talking about photonic crystals and uh, structures with epsilon and mu negative, you can extend the concept uh, behind metamaterials to acoustic waves, phonons, elastic waves, plasmons, etc. So, like the concept of a photonic crystal and band gaps in photonic crystals, uh, the concept of negative refraction and metamaterials has been demonstrated uh, even for water waves. Okay, so it's a uh, general uh, wave phenomenon. So, what can metamaterials do? Uh, essentially, they can make every wave phenomenon you know about um, behave in an unprecedented, left-handed, uh, gauche um, sort of way. I'm left-handed, so I can use uh, that word um, in a non-discriminatory fashion. Uh, gauche, and for those who don't know the French word, means awkward. And generally, uh, left-handers are supposed to be awkward. I prefer to call us uh, naturally gifted. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, metamaterials and left-handed materials make, wave, make waves behave in unprecedented ways. If you did a ray trace of a metamaterial or a negative index material and wrote it down in your physics exam in 1995, you'd be marked wrong, you'd be called an idiot by your lecturer, because nature doesn't behave like that. Well, nature can be made to behave like that. So, you get negative refraction, you can get Cherenkov effect. You can get the bow waves going the other way. You can get goose hansen shift negative. I've shown you that. Uh, you can create cloaking. You can make a perfect lens uh, with a slab of dielectric uh, as long as that slab uh, has got negative index. Um, there are, of course, problems, and these problems are keeping experimentalists and theoreticians uh, busy. The problems are, I've said that you get negative refraction and metamaterials uh, due to resonances. Resonances are always finite frequency effects, so you've got a problem of bandwidth. You've got a problem also, uh, frequently you need metals uh, to make these metamaterials. Whenever you've got metals, uh, you've got uh, epsilon, the permittivity, uh, with an uh, imaginary part which gives you loss. Um, and this loss is uh, a difficulty. Um, as well, I said um, the uh, wave, uh, the structure should be fine compared with the wavelength of light. So, if you're trying to make uh, a metamaterial for the visible, that means that elements of the structure have to be of the size of 50 nanometers. So this is a structure which is very finely scaled compared with light, uh, and it takes um, uh, quite expensive equipment. Um, and uh, fortunately, the semiconductor industry has come to the rescue there because second-hand lithography machines from the semiconductor industry uh, don't cost as much um, as they used to. So, in fact, this sort of manufacture has become accessible. Uh, it's an exciting field. Uh, it attracts lots of investigators from different areas, uh, physics, mathematics, electrical engineering, etc., 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 uh, refers to the fact that you can get all these uh, things uh, for uh, waves of different types. So I've got a colleague at the University of Liverpool uh, who's very interested in uh, hiding uh, buildings from earthquakes using the same mechanism, this time for um, the sort of uh, waves uh, which propagate uh, due to earthquakes. Uh, these, these are long, essentially surface waves, so it's similar to the problem of cloaking placements. I think I'll stop at that point um, uh, for questions uh, before I go on to the second part.
predict the future, like how close are we to actually making a useful metal material in, let's say, just near infrared maybe? Um, there is an interesting connection between 